Okay, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, we'll kick off um, just a little past eight. Uh, some, you might have been talking to some of your club people. They might be having trouble getting signing in. Um, just some issues with browsers and different things. Uh, Kieran will keep an eye on it as we're going along and he'll, uh, he'll invite people as we go. Um, so firstly, thanks for joining in. Uh, Hopefully you find some use out of today. It will be quite informative. I just want to take you through the system here. If you start moving your cursor around the screen, you can see mine moving there. So obviously this red button here is the hang up. Uh, this one here, if you have it, shows the participants that has joined us in. And then this one here is a conversation. So I have a, a message that I done up earlier on a different device. So basically, we want to use this form to um, ask any questions if you have any observations as we're going along or you see anything and you want to ask a question for the lads as they're presenting. Uh, just use that chat down in the bottom right hand corner, just down here and um, hit the little airplane button and that will send your question. Kieran is going to keep an eye on these as we go along and um, all going well, we'll be able to answer your questions and um, hopefully you'll have a an informative hour with us. So firstly, uh, I'm going to sign off here. I'm going to try and um, run the things uh, behind the scenes. Paddy O'Connor, uh, one of our GDAs, and Kieran McGuckey, our GDA from Longford Slashers, they're going to take over the running of today. So I'll hand it over to the two lads and um, bid you farewell until the end. So hopefully you enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks, Damien. Um, so just as, as Damien said, we hope you get a lot out of this hour. Um, we put together, I suppose, a, a group of um, games, but also a group of coaches that put stuff together that, that give you a broad range of stuff that's happening and what will help you develop with your players. So it's going to work through basically PowerPoint and some videos. So there's going to be five videos and they'll play and then we'll discuss the videos and uh, talk you through what's 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 happening in them and uh, how we can develop them for your players. So Damien's is going to throw up the, the PowerPoint there now. And as Damien said, don't be afraid to throw some questions into the um, the chat box. Because that, that's where we're going to do all the learning. All the learning will come from yourselves after you see the, the PowerPoint presentation and the, and the games and stuff. So that's really, really important. So we're going to kick it off there now. So this program is developed mainly for you coaches all the way to adults. So it's stuff that you can use from your under 13 all the way to your, your minor level and adult. So these games can be can be altered and, and changed to suit whichever level suits and what, what ability of player you have. So that's why we put this together and, and the areas we picked are for the specific age groups we're talking about. Fire on, David. One of the, I suppose, the, the cornerstones of the stuff we're trying to do with clubs at the minute is, is look at Turris. Turris is our, our club our club uh, development programme and there's principles and what is good coaching. So Turris is our principle we use for everything we do. So every game, every drill, every activity, every session we do, we try and align it with Turris all the time. And I suppose the big thing about Turris is that it's it's a model for good coaching. If you take the Turris box, you're doing something good and that's very, very important. So we'll go into that a little bit later, which is... The aim is supposed to look at four key areas of developing your youth footballer. So also we're going to examine five key games that, that you can use, but how they work. And not you might have seen these games before, but the big thing is that we're going to describe how we can adapt the games at any time to any players and any development needs that the players need through the step model. And developing these games, you'll come away with five or six different ways of doing it, but you will also have five or six different ways you, yourself of doing these games. So that's the most important thing. You come away with something new that you can use in the field. The, the main idea behind these webinars was is that when you go back to your club, that the club is in a better position. You're in a better place to, to, to make your team better and develop and, and keep your footballers improving all the time and enjoying their football and that they come back ready to go and that your sessions are, are, are flying. Finally, we're going to look at, I suppose, the, the resource. So we have a resource put together with more games um, just from tonight. We could have done a book of games with you, 
and just showed you 15, 20 games and said, there you go, lads, here's the games, but we wanted to really look in depth. So after tonight, you'll be able to click on the website and then we'll go through that. It's the resources that we've given you and that you can use with your players going forward. So the sections are scoring, kicking, possession and support and tackling. So they're the four areas we're going to be working on through all the games. So the first game here is by uh, John Higgins. John is a, a former development squad coach and minor coach, but also one of our main tutors and does all our, our, our coach education stuff. So John, a very experienced coach all the way from school by level all the way up to senior level. So really good coach, some really good ideas. So here's John's uh, video now. John Higgins here. I've been asked by Lord for GA to document my favourite game. My favourite game is a game called Circle Score. It's a quite easy game set up and can be used from any age group from under 13 to all the way up to adult. The game itself provides a huge amount of opportunity to work on any of the skills in Gaelic football, but primarily today we'll be dealing with shooting and decision making, while also talking about tackling, solo, the block and kick pass. But as you will see in the document attached with this video, this game can be adapted in order to coach any skill in Gaelic. To play this game, you will need cones of varying sizes, footballs, bibs, two sets is ideal, a set of portable goals, and as many players from eight to unlimited can play this game. The setup is quite simple. You place a set of portable goals in the middle of the field. You then get your cones. I use the flexi, flexible flexi markers for safety reasons and place them in a circle around the goals. It is important to note that the players will be shooting from outside this circle. So therefore you need to know the ability or the shooting ability of the players that you, have, you are coaching in order to set this up correctly. As you do not want them shooting from outside their comfort zone or their scoring range. You then pick two teams and place them in different coloured bibs and place them on the outside of the circle. Players should be in pairs at this stage. If you have an uneven numbers, it doesn't really matter. The coach will then throw up a ball in between one pair. The team who emerge with the ball will be the attackers for the time being. The attacking team must try and work the ball into a scoring position and kick the ball over the bar. Once the ball is kicked, whether the ball drops short, goes over the bar, or goes wide, the ball still stays in play. So the game is a continuous game. Once the ball lands inside the circle, it is free to be contested by any player. The defending team try their best to dispossess or turn over the attacking team. If they win possession, they straight away turn into the attacking team from any position and try and work a score. One key observation in this game is to find where the players are congregating. You will find that in all age groups, players tend to follow the ball at the very beginning and will end up in clusters. This will give you as the coach a great chance to stop, pause and question the players on how to best create space during this type of a game. If we now look at part two of the setup, I've just added in a dividing line across the middle of the field. This dividing line will prove very useful in our next number of games. The teams are still split, a team A and a team B, but now half of team A will be on the top half and the other half will be on the bottom, and similarly with team B. Once team A have the ball, if they cannot work the ball into a shooting position, on the top side, they can look for a teammate who may be in a better position on the bottom. This will help players develop spatial awareness and also to play with their heads up, as they can see players who may be in a better position to work the ball and also not to try to carry the ball into trouble if they are being crowded out on, say, the top half of the field. Similarly with part one, once the ball is kicked or lands in the circle, 
it is a free for all. So team A or team B, no matter who has kicked the ball, both teams can fight for possession and work the ball into a scoring position again. You can let the game run on for as long as you feel, but the best time to stop it is once the tempo drops or when they have got good at it. At this type of game where no, numerous variations can be brought in to challenge the, the players further. As I outlined at the beginning, I said the primary skills in this game were decision making and shooting, which hopefully I'll be explained at this stage. But how best do we work on our secondary skills? In the document attached, I have outlined some ways or ideas in which we can work on the tackle, the block, the solo and the kick pass. But the best thing about this game is that we can make a number of different changes to the conditions which work on various skills of the game. For example, the block. One simple way of incorporating the block into this game is to change the scoring system. As always, we can give the forward team one point for every score they kick. However, to incentivize the block, we can make it two points for every block that the defending team get. Therefore, you will see more players attempting to make the block during the course of the game. We can do a similar thing with the solo and the tackle. The, the attacking team are told that once they receive the ball, they must take a solo or take on their man. This will give the defending team an opportunity to get a frontal tackle or in fact maybe a near hand tackle in and therefore increasing the opportunity for the defending team to get tackles in and work on that during the course of the game. They're just two small examples and I have listed a few more in the document attached as I have said already. There are other ways in which you can make the game more relevant to some of the, your players. For example, your goalkeeper. You can place your goalkeeper in goals. This game will give your goalie a prime opportunity to field high balls. During the course of the game, there will be a number of balls that will drop short in the circle or in around the goals. Your goalie will have to be alert to see which team kicked the ball. And you can put the condition on the goalie that whatever team kicked the ball in, he must return the ball to the opposition team. So again, you could work on your quick kickouts, your quick restarts from the goalkeeper there, and it works on his concentration levels as well. Another rule that you could bring in, particularly for the defending team, is that any foul committed is an automatic score. This encourages discipline in the tackle, and again, is making the game very relevant to a match situation. Another way of altering the game is to incorporate two stationary players on either side of the circle. These stationary players play with no bib. Therefore, if team A fist pass or kick pass the ball to the stationary player, the stationary player must pass the ball back to team A. This will encourage off the shoulder running of the stationary player. To incentivize this further, you can award an extra score or two for a score that is worked off the shoulder. Again, this will all depend on what you are trying to work at or incorporate into your training sessions and to work with, with your team at the time. In the document attached, I have added in a few more conditioned games that you can use within this game. And I have also added in a few scoring system changes which can work on various skills. But as I have said, the game is quite adaptable and extremely useful. And finally, if we look at our Torres principles, we can see that this game it ticks all the boxes. It tests the players with all the different variations that you can make to the game. It definitely is player centered, as you can see what the individual is doing and what they are doing in a team situation as well. Does it resemble the game? Yes, it definitely does. The players will find themselves in numerous game situations and as a coach, this will give you a great opportunity to see what's going on and to spot and fix anything that you, you feel is needed. Players are involved all the time, whether they're on the ball or off the ball. There is also an opportunity to add in a second ball, particularly when you split the pitch in two. Whereas you could have one ball going on one side and one ball going on the other side, particularly if you're dealing with large numbers. This will keep the players really switched on. It might be a little bit chaotic at the beginning, 
but it definitely will challenge the players even further. And the last one, S, sh should be enjoyable. Again, I think all age groups from under 13 to adult thoroughly enjoy this game. As a coach, it's definitely a game that you can get a lot of. It's a game, as I have said earlier, that I have used with every age group from under 13 to adult level. And I have always found it beneficial and enjoyable myself. So give it a go. If there's any questions, please don't hesitate to give Damien or Paddy a shout in the office and I will only be too glad to help um, with any queries. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, very informative uh, information there from John. Um, the circle score game. So we all definitely would have would have played that before. It would have been something that we all would have used, but there's loads of different variations there in the circle and score game and loads of varieties. And one of the things that I would have never thought of until I seen John's um, video was playing the extra person, playing the extra man, um, and let them be, a, I suppose, a feeder to the other people. So if you have an extra person on either side of, of the circle that you can play off the, off the shoulder, but also on the loop running. So a lot of scores nowadays come on the loop when a ball is given in, a guy wins and a guy comes off the shoulder on the far side. So it's a really good way of working off the loop. Another way, I suppose, what the, the circle score game is really good for is it, it, actually working on fitness. Like working on 5v5, 6v6, 7v7, there's no harm to have a circle score game going on, maybe a 5v5 game, play for three minutes and have the other five people doing some other exercise and just rotate them around. So have have one game going on and one other exercise on the outside of the pitch going ahead, maybe a, a, a block and drill or some sort of skill development side of things, and then just rotate them around. But they're getting loads of touches of the ball, loads of decisions in that. And so it's, it's a really good game for that and working on your shooting accuracy. Um, Kieran, would you have anything else just to add to that? Yeah, I suppose a um, brilliant game for um, shooting and team play. All right, John mentioned you can change conditions. Uh, myself, I've... Um, use it in a way that you even get an extra point for the same team catching it on the other side of the post as well. So you're working on your height catch or your body catch as well at the other side. Um, I've also introduced a shot clock. So if there's not too many opportunities being created, all of a sudden you put in 15, 16 seconds that they must get a shot away. All of a sudden there's a lot more points being taken. And that's just pretty much put, pretty much it. John's kind of covered everything, the conditions there. Yeah, they definitely. And there, there's another couple of options there. And then, Finally, I suppose if you're, if you're working on shooting, there's other ways you can obviously challenge them. A nice way just is an exercise here that the Dublin ladies and footballers would have used over the years that I would take enough from Mick Bohan, a coach. It's, it's a two-ball shooting exercise. So basically what happens is on the yellow cone, someone will start with two footballs. They'll loop around the red cone, which is 21 metres out. They'll kick it over with their right foot. They'll come back around and they'll go around and they'll kick it with the other red cone with their left foot. Then they'll collect another two balls. They'll kick with their right, kick with their left at 28 metre line. They'll go back in again, collect another two footballs, solo out two balls in hands, they're using both sides all the time, and pop the ball over the bar. Now, that's a great way of, of, I suppose, working on both sides shooting, but what it does is it gives the players an idea of saying, right, I got seven out of your 18 shots that time. What can I get the next day? And it's a nice little exercise to do. So you all would have different, um, I suppose, skill challenges or shooting challenges and scoring challenges that you'd like to do with your teams. Maybe put that in and let the players do it each session. Let them spend a couple of minutes at it and see are they improving. But this one here just works on both sides. You have your shots either side and then you, you have two on each one and then you have one on each other. So it makes 18 shots all together. So it's a really good exercise. Again, the distances, you can alter that then. The furthest distance there is 35 metres. Maybe that's too much for your under 14 or maybe some of your under 16s. Well, you can bring it in. You can start maybe on 16 metre line and move up in maybe five or six metre intervals as you go along then. So that's a good exercise of kind of practice it, the, the shooting and practice the scoring element of it. So the next one, next video um, we're going to play is by Frank McNamee, former Longford under 21 boss, former Longford footballer and former Longford or uh, Dublin um, minor manager. He's going to go through a skicking, kicking game called Kicking Across the Zones. This is a very simple skills development game that I found works very well for age groups anywhere from 13 up to senior. It's a small sided game with the primary objective to develop kick passing accuracy and technique. The approach I will take is to firstly explain how the game works, 
how it is scored, and then I'll go through the questions that Damien has set out to explain the structure of the game in more detail. So, you begin by marking out an area on the pitch where cones are shown. I've set out a 5x4 grid in this case, but it can be 4x4, even 3x3, as the game can be adapted depending on the ages of the players and the numbers that you have. If you look at the way the gameplay area is set out, it appears like a grid, and that basically is exactly what it is. Let's take a look at this grid now from a zoomed in perspective. If we bring out a couple of players to explain the game, the simple premise is that when a player on a team kicks a pass to a teammate that is caught cleanly, then he scores for his team. If the ball crosses one line from one zone to the next, then he gets one point. If he kicks it across two lines or two zones away, he gets two points. And for crossing three lines or three zones, he gets three points. The kicking can be in any direction. So if it is diagonal, the same thing. One point for crossing one zone to the next, two for two zones and three for three zones. Whenever the player gets the ball in the grid, he will try to kick pass to a teammate and to get a score. It could be at any place in the grid. It could be in the centre, on the left, the right, wherever it is. But the same scoring principle applies. A kick pass that is caught cleanly across one zone is one point, two zones, two points, three zones, three points, etc. That is the scoring principle of the game. To reiterate, think of the grid with a set of imaginary lines. Once across the line, it is a score of one, two or three or four scores. You don't need lines, uh, you, it's fine with cones, but you can set the game up so that some of the cones are on the pitch lines if you so wish. So we have two teams. Let's go with five aside, yellow and red bibs. You start the game as the coach, you give one of the teams the ball, and each player is trying to help his team get a score. The team with the most scores at the end of the game wins, simple as that. OK, let's work through Damien's questions now and explore the game in more detail. What's the game called? Kicking across the zones. What does the game improve? Well, the first objective of the game is to improve kick pass accuracy. Each team will be trying to accumulate scores by accurate kicking across zones. This is the game. As you evolve the game over time, you can incorporate more of a focus on handling skills of first touch if you want. Remember, the game is about kicking, but if you play the game over a number of weeks and you want to add to the skills being employed in the game, then you can go first and foremost for handling. You can include spatial awareness and game vision as well, as these are all parts of the game. First touch and the basic skill of catching is obviously important because in this game, the receiver must catch the ball cleanly to score a point. Spatial awareness is important because as the game goes on, they will appreciate even more how important this actually is. You will notice the first time you run the game, you will see that they are all very clustered. They're centered and grouped around the ball and they're all very, very close to the ball carrier. This is especially true with younger players. As they get more used to the game and they play it more often, they begin to understand better the idea of moving into space and they start to look for the ball more outside the central areas and further away from the ball carrier. This spatial awareness is something that evolves, of course, as players get older, but it is a good piece of game intelligence to expose players to from a younger age if you can, and this game is one way to do that. Also, because they are continuously running to get the ball, running to make passes, there's a decent element of fitness and running in this game as well. They're trying to lose their markers and they're trying to run into space, so there's a bit of running involved. You'll also notice the first time you run this game that the player on the ball will often struggle to see other players that are free around him or her. And this is what I mean by game vision or playing with a head up. Again, the, this game sense awareness and the use of your peripheral vision develops in players over time. But again, this is a good game to get players using it from an early age. They know they're not going to score for their team unless they convert a kick pass. And in order to do this, they have to be able to look up and see who is available. So the player on the ball learns to scan the pitch to see what other players are free. And this is an important element of kick passing and, and indeed an important element of game intelligence for any Gaelic football player. What age groups is this game appropriate for? for I would say from 13 right up to adult. How do you set up the game? Typically, it's in a, an area of about 40 to 40, but again, this is adaptable depending on the age group of the players you have and the numbers that you have. Once you run the game a couple of times, you'll get to know the kind of space that you need to make the game work well uh, based on the numbers that you have. 
number of players, it works best, I would say, with five or six aside, but it can really go from anywhere between three aside up to eight aside. And because of that, because it's a small side of the game, it does work well as, as a station game if you are dividing players into groups and you're working on, on a skills session, or it can be incorporated as part of any session in a skills element of that particular session. Equipment, you need cones and bibs for each team and just one football. Rules and conditions that can be introduced throughout. One condition that I would always introduce at some stage, usually towards the end of the game, is a bonus play. So that a successful kick pass with the weaker foot counts as double. So, so if the guy in the ball is right footed and he makes a good kick, successful kick over two zones that's cleanly caught with his left foot, then instead of being worth two, it's now worth four. This is a really good addition to the game. And especially if it's close, you will notice that players then will, will try to use their weaker foot more often to get more scores for their team, which is something that you want to encourage. The scoring system I've mentioned and explained, basically again, just to reiterate, kick pass caught cleanly by the receiver as a score. So again, for example, red bib to red bib, scored one, two or three, or four points, depending on how many zones you can kick the ball across. What adaptations can be made for weaker or stronger players? You may find that, particularly with younger players, if they are finding it difficult to convert a pass successfully to a receiver over distance, they may be finding it very hard to find a player or they may be finding it very difficult to be able to find a player with one pass that's caught cleanly going directly to the receiver. So if this is the case, maybe allow for, instead of one clean kick direct pass, allow for a one bounce pass so that uh, in order to get the score, it can bounce once before it gets to the receiver. Another adaptation that you can allow for is if they're struggling to handle the ball first time, if the ball's dropping a little, you can allow for two touches maybe to get the ball. So you can allow for a fumble and a recovery and this will get the point. I've mentioned already about the bonus play for double scores for a kick with a weaker foot and, and this will encourage the stronger players to do that. How much time was the game played for? I found the optimal time to be about nine or 10 minutes for this game, possibly up to 12. Um, typically I run it for three minutes and then take a break. And you ask them questions like, how can your team improve their score? How can we get better at the game? And they will be really good. Over time, they will tell you, they'll come up with the answers, they'll tell you that, well, we need to get more into space to be able to receive the ball. We need to look up more when we have the ball and make sure we can see who's available. Play with the head up. They will come up with all the answers. How do you know when to change a rule or a condition? Well, you'll know when the enthusiasm and the energy starts to flag a bit. And that's why I would normally break it after three minutes. So the game in total, you'll see, especially if you're playing three by three minutes, um, it's definitely a good idea to introduce the bonus play in the third game because this game works well when, when it's low and competitive and they're full of running. You'll know when that starts to flag a little bit and it's time then to either end the game or to introduce that bonus play extra condition. What other activities might complement the game? Well, again, having played it a number of times, you might decide to include additional skills like evasion skills and or tackling skills. It's not a direct part of the game because it's about kicking, but if you want to include it, you could. So, for example, in order for the kicker to make the pass successfully, he has to perhaps beat his defender and get into space, and that might take an evasion skill. So you could give a point, an extra point for successful uh, sidestep or, or spin or dummy solo or something like that. And you could include tackling if you want to as well. So you could give an extra point for a team that dispossesses the opponent who has the ball and makes a recovery or makes a turnover. So you could add in division skills and tackling skills over time if you so wish. I'll skip to the last question, is it enjoyable? I found the players like this game. Um, it's competitive. And especially an important point is that you as the coach, you're contributing to this by keeping a running score so that you're shouting the score as the game is on. So it's one point each and then well done Reds, that's a three pointer. So now you're going four, one, up, oh, well done. And then, OK, guys, you got to get two points. It's back to four, three. Can you get two more to keep it ahead? So you're continually encouraging them as the game is being played. You're giving them a run total. And usually you will find that the, it's competitive and it's close and it's a game that they're enjoying. So just to summarise, it's a simple, small-sided game played in a zone grid. Two teams trying to win by outscoring the other, as in any game. They score by converting a kick pass to a teammate that is caught cleanly. A player can score one point or two points, three points or four points for their team, depending on the kick that they make, how accurate it is over the distances that are allowed. Over time, you will definitely see kick passing improving with this game, along with the other skills. So enjoy.
Okay, so there was Frank's kicking game. Um, and one of the things that would have, I suppose, been came in my head when looking at this game and, and watching it was Frank mentioned there a good few times um, kicking, but he didn't mention what type of kick. And what we're trying to, I suppose, get into there is that all the different types of kicks can be used. And we just have a little um, a table done out here of the, the coaching points of the three main kicks you would use. There obviously is other kicks as well, but the punt kick, the hook kick, and the swerve kick. And players can decide what kick they want to use, but or you can say, right, we're working on the hook kick, we're working on the punt kick, we're working on the swerve kick. But it's very important that players make their own decision on that as well. And when you look at the, the, the kick and technique, I've just marked out the red areas here are the only things that are different in the technique. So if you look at the, the punt kick, your head down, eye on the ball, hook kick, head down, eye on the ball, swerve kick, head down, eye on the ball. They're all the exact same, bar one or two little things. So maybe it's the connection of the boot or where their arms are going. But what I'd say to you is when you're, cook, uh, I suppose, coaching the kick, get the things that are similar in all the kicks down, down to a tee, like the head down, same hand, same foot, really important. Once you do that, all the kicks will develop from there. So that's really, really important. So it's just a little table to show you that all kicks are so, so similar. If you get the basics right of the head, the hands and the feet, and there's one or two little changes in each kick, the players will develop a good array of kicks that they can use in all these games. So they're not just using the punt kick or using the hook kick or the swerve kick, that they can try out these kicks and make a decision when is the right time to, to use the hook kick, when is the right time to use the punt kick and the swerve kick. And in games, that's when they'll get the opportunity to do that. But just to go through a couple of the coaching points there, and you can look at it in the manual at the end, but that's, I think that's a really important point that uh, we can bring to kicking. The other thing um, Frank would have talked about was questioning. And that's really, really important. Asking questions of your players. Let them make the decisions. Ask them, was that the right kick to make? Um, where should you kick it? When should you kick it? So all them things. And rather than us telling them the answer, you should have played the ball into Nile in the full forward line. You should have played the ball out to the wing. Well, what was your best option there? Was your best option into the full forward line or was your best option out onto the wing? And let the players make them decisions. And that's when where games are so, so important. And if you can ask questions when you're, when you're playing games, players will develop far more uh, quicker. And they, again, when they cross the white line on the pitch, they'll be making decisions, not you on, on the sideline. Because at the end of the day, when they cross the white line, it's them that are going to put the ball wide or kick the ball wrong. So it's important that they make the decisions themselves. Um, so the, the next one is from James Carroll. So we're going to play a video from James Carroll, uh, teaching in Knuckwara. But one of my favourite games, I've titled the breakout and timed the run due to the two different strands in the game. The first strand being a group of players out around the middle of the field, holding possession of the ball and waiting for a time to break out of a square and kick good ball into the forwards. And then the second strand is the forwards inside, time of the runs, and with a good first touch, gain a possession of the ball, and then obviously their interplay afterwards. So before we set up the pitch and talk about the actual mechanics of the game, we're going to run through some of the improvements we hope to see in players after having run the exercise. Primarily the exercises for the full forward line. We're interested in seeing if they can develop the timings of the runs, if they can understand the importance of creating space for the other players in the full forward line. We want them to make sure that their first touch is really good and then we're interested in their interplay afterwards, whether that's taking on their man for their own score or whether that's bringing their teammates into the play if they get bottled up. We're really interested in the men taking on their defender and trying to go for the score. But the importance that the other players can take part in the exercise not only creates space for that forward with the ball, but also allows for a pass if there's a better option on. Just as the timing of the runs is really important for the forwards, it's really important that the defenders are able to read the game. In terms of, are they able to make interceptions, number one? If not, can they contain them until support arrives? And can they pressure them enough so that the shot goes wide or short? For the players out the field who are playing in the small side of the game, we're interested in them being able to hold possession of the ball whilst they wait for the opportunity to kick it in. For the opposing team, we're trying to cut down the space, initiate contact, improve our tackling in tight quarters so that we can create turnovers in the game. Finally, it's really important that the players have an opportunity to be able to develop their kick pass into a group of forwards under pressure conditions. And also what they do after the kick in terms of support running in after the ball. Suitable ages are from 13 years of age up to adult level. And the version we're going to outline here can be used with a panel of 24 to 30 players. You know, it's designed in such a way to try and keep a large group of players active and engaged the whole time. Here we're going to use the full pitch, both the goals. We're going to divide the area into two small-sided games around the middle. 
and then two scoring games which take place from the end line to the 45. If you have a reduced number of players, so 14 plus, we can still play this game. We just half the resources that we have and we go with one small sided game and just use one of the goals and half the pitch. So we'll set up the pitch and then allocate the players to the various regions. So the first area of the pitch that we're going to section off is we're going to use cones to mark out a grid that's roughly 5 metres by 5 metres between the two 45s, ideally between the 45 metre line and the halfway line. In this grid we're going to have a possession game between four blue bib players and four red bib players, ideally players taken from the half back, midfield and half forward positions. We're going to duplicate this grid on the right hand side of the pitch and the main reason for this is so that all the players on the panel are actively engaged all the time. Each end of the pitch will then have a scoring area where we'll position three full forwards matched up directly against three full backs. And again, these are duplicated at both ends of the pitch to make maximum use of our full panel. This version is set up at the minute for 28 players. We have eight players in each of the small sided games around the middle of the pitch, with six players at each of the goal mounts at either end. If we have slightly less numbers than 28, we can reduce a couple of the players on the grid around the outside and play three on three. And if we have slightly more players than 28, we can add additional players to the grid. There's also an opportunity for us to add extra full forwards and defenders behind the goals, rotating in for each cycle of the exercise. For numbers from 14 to about 24, we can make do with half the pitch, getting rid of one of the small sided games and one of the shooting areas, and playing one grid into one shooting area. Again, we can modify the number of players in the grid, adding players or subtracting players, and we can also have a second team of six players ready to go and act as the forwards and defenders. Initially, we can have it that the left-hand grid plays into the goals to the south, and the right-hand grid plays into the goals to the north. But halfway through the exercise, make sure to change which grid plays into which goals to ensure that a variety of angles of balls are coming into the forwards. Okay, so to take one small-sided game grid and one shooting area and discuss the mechanics of the game, Remember that this game is then going to be duplicated on the left grid and the goals to the south of the pitch, if we have the numbers for that, so that we keep everybody involved and engaged in the exercise. So a coach starts the game by throwing the ball into the blue team, who must retain possession of the ball through hand passing in this grid for the next 10 seconds. The coach then blows the whistle, at which point the person in possession of the ball has to try and kick pass a ball into the full forwards inside. If it takes an extra hand pass or two to get free and ensure the accuracy of the pass, that's fine. Once the ball is kicked in, the play is over for all the players in the grid. When the whistle goes to announce that the ball can be kicked in, the three full forwards inside begin to make their runs. So the idea would be that forward one makes a run in one direction, forward two observing this run makes a run in a different direction, and then forward three holds his nerve and waits to see what corrections are made in the runs by the other players before committing to his run. So in this scenario, forward one has corrected his run, which makes space then for forward three to run into. The idea is that this will all have happened within a couple of seconds of blowing the whistle, and that the player in possession in the grid is free now to kick the ball into the forward. The forward's first thought is to collect clean possession of the ball, making sure that their first touch is good, and they then try and take on their man to create their own score. All the other players are kept involved in the play, and so if the defender has done his job and contained the forward, there's outlet ball through the other forwards. Once the ball goes dead, either through a score or a wide, or if the defenders gain possession, the play is dead, and we come back out to the grid to start again. The coach then gives the ball to the other team, in this case the Reds, and they retain possession for 10 seconds before they kick their ball in. A couple of things to note. First of all, the bibs allocated to the players in the grid do not have to be the same colours as those allocated to the forwards and the backs. Whoever has possession of the ball on the grid is playing with the forwards for that cycle of the game. Another important aspect to make sure that there's a flow to the game is that the coach or another player always has a ball ready to kick into the forwards in case the small sided game is spoiled, either through a dispossession or a lost ball or some fumbling. This will ensure that the game inside can carry on even if the small sided game was unsuccessful for that cycle. One last thing to notice is that though we played this ball in here, a first time ball to a forward making a good run is obviously the most preferable. If we define that the defence is well on top of the game and we want to introduce an extra attacking element, we can have it such that when the ball is kicked in, the player who's kicked in the ball can join the attack and become an extra attacker. 
So this gives the defence something extra to think about, whilst also allowing the players out of the field to get involved actively in the play and shoot for their scores as well. In this first scenario, his marker goes with him and joins the play as an extra defender. When that cycle has ended, both those players make their way around the outside of the pitch back to the grid, and we play three on three the next time, which should also create extra space and allow us for a cleaner ball into the forwards the next time. A further modification would be to only let the attacker go and join the play, leaving the defender in the grid, where on the next cycle, we have a four versus three matchup, again, allowing for greater attacking play, more freedom and space in the box, which allows us a cleaner pass into the forwards. If we find that the attackers are on top of the game, we can position an extra defender in front of the front three. So his job will be to cut off space, making it more difficult to kick good ball into the forwards. This will focus the players outfield on the accuracy of the kick passes and focus our full forwards on making better runs to create more space in an area that's now become quite congested. The next amendment we can make is if we find that the game in the grid is becoming a little bit lacklustre, we can create a condition such that a turnover allows the team that turned over the ball to immediately play the ball inside to the forwards. So we're creating an incentive for the defending team to turn over ball so that they can become the creators of the score. The forwards inside just need to be watching the game more closely, making themselves aware when a turnover takes place so that they know that the team in possession now of the ball is the attacking team. The next amendment we can make to the game is if we find that the competition is too great in the small sided game, and as a result the quality of ball inside is very poor, we can create two strips of uncontested areas whereby when the whistle blows, the player in possession of the ball can break into these two areas and cannot be tackled so that they can cleanly kick in the ball into the forwards. The last condition we might like to introduce is a high diagonal ball into the forwards. So when the first and second player have made their runs, a high diagonal ball can be kicked in to the player remaining in the large rectangle. So a couple of adaptations we can make to the game to make sure that weaker and stronger players are all catered for. So the first thing is in the small side of the game, there's going to be a lot of tough tackling and tight possession. So we want to match players off according to their ability and maybe their size. If we find that weaker players are not getting involved in this small side of the game out the field, we can introduce a rule that rather than 10 seconds before we blow the whistle, we're not going to blow the whistle until every player gets a touch or gets a pass on the ball. At that stage, we can blow the whistle and the ball can be kicked in. So we want to make sure in the shooting areas, we have our best forwards matched off against our best defenders. We're trying to ensure that our forwards are working really hard to get free from tight marking defenders and learn how to make runs that will get them possession of the ball, but also create space for those around them. If we're finding that the same forward is making good runs every time and receiving every ball from the small side of game, we might introduce a condition so that the players in the small side of game know that they have to target a particular forward on particular plays without actually letting the three forwards inside know this. The game is heavily favoured towards forwards, particularly if the ball inside is good. So if we find the forwards are too strong, we can adjust by adding the extra defender, or we can introduce penalties for poor first touches. As mentioned already, if the backs are on top, we can introduce runners coming from the small side of the game to add an extra dimension on how the players might have to defend in that situation. For the duration of the game, we set a ball limit rather than a team limit for the game. So we tell teams that they're going to get 15 to 20 balls each into the scoring areas. And we can score the game then based on scores allowed and scores prevented. If the tempo starts to drop from the game, that's when we can start making adjustments. For example, players breaking from the small side of the game or introducing an extra defender. The exercise encompasses a wide range of football and skills such as hand passing, kick passing, tackling, support running and shooting. And so any drills in these areas prior to running this exercise would be complementary. And this exercise would add to those drills in terms of bringing some game-based focus to them. To summarise, the activity should be challenging for all the players involved. The forwards have to learn how to create space and make runs. Defenders are learning to stick tight, contain their marker and try and create turnovers through pressure. And the outfielders have a great responsibility to mind the ball and give in accurate passes to the forwards. If it breaks down around the middle of the field, well then the forwards can't do their business. It's a player-centred activity because it allows the players to develop strategies that will work for them in a game. The coaches then have plenty of opportunity to amend the games to suit the players' needs or based on feedback that might be given to them during the activity itself. The exercise very much resembles a game-type situation where players are playing as they would in a game. They're set out in similar positions as they would take up on the pitch, 
learning specific key roles for that position that they can take into games. They're playing in the right direction towards the goals with an end goal of scoring. We can create this game in such a way that all the players are involved at all times. They're actively engaged, participating in their area of the pitch. To ensure the thing doesn't become too frantic, we have to make sure to build in periods of rest, uh, but there's no standing around. So we, we take a break for 30 seconds and then we get set and we go again. It should be an enjoyable activity because it does replicate game situations. Everybody is involved and everyone has their own challenges in the game. And there's a competitive aspect to the exercise which players should enjoy. Okay, so just we'll be going on to another one now. Just to remind people, just if you have any questions, just please put them into the chat and we'll come back to them after the next video. I see one or two in there. My favorite game is what I call the three channels game. This game is primarily used to improve a team's principles of transition from defense to attack, as well as the principles of attack. Some of the secondary improvements include the decision making of the player both on and off the ball, the link play between the forward and back unit, the attacking support runs made by your attackers, midfielders, or defenders and the effectiveness of the ball movement within the transition from defence to attack and within your attacking play. The game is primarily aimed at under 16 to adult players. The reason for this is that at these age groups, tactical awareness and team play are coming much more to the fore. Ideally, the game is played with 30 players, that being two teams of 15. However, it can be modified for 16 plus players where the length of the pitch is altered. The pitch is set up using the full pitch with the two large goals. Three channels are created using small saucer cones and each of these channels is 25 metres in width and runs from end line to end line as you will see within the next diagram. You will need 8 to 10 footballs at least to run this game. We can see here the setup of the pitch using the cones. The cones run from end line to end line, and the three channels are as follows. Channel number one runs from the sideline at the top to the mid red cones. Channel number two, also known as the middle channel, runs from red cone to blue cone. Channel number three runs from blue cone to the near sideline. Here we can see a setup with the players included. Please note the position of the coach. The coach in this game will maintain their position in the middle third of the field, moving as the play moves. And finally, we can see a setup of a shortened game based upon a 12 v 12 teams. As you will note, the pitch length has been shortened, the small goals being placed at the top of the D. We shortened the length of the pitch only as we want to maintain the width of the pitch at all times. We do this so that our players get used to using the full width of the pitch in their attacking transitions and their attacking play. The game. The game itself will start with the ball being thrown up by the coach in the middle of the field. The restarts for the first few minutes will start from the goalkeeper after a score has been scored. This gets the players used to restarting from a kick out and transitioning from defence to attack after a kick out. The next restarts will take place where the ball will be taken from the side of the pitch or these balls can be placed along the middle of the pitch. For example, if the yellow team shooting up this way gets a score, the greys, grey team will restart with one of these balls in the middle of the field and will try to exploit the yellow team being out of shape and get a score down this end. The ball will always start along the, this middle area for these restarts. Finally, an example of the other restart that we can use during the course of this game. The yellow teams again are attacking. They have the ball in this attacking position. The coach is going to dictate when the restart happens now. In this case, the yellow team, as they're attacking, may either be turned over 
by the grey team, who then transition down the field, or if the attacking play is taking a long time, the coach will then decide from where the restart happens. He may drop the ball where he is positioned here in the middle of the field, and the restart will happen from there, or else he may play it into one of these zones where there is space, and the greys will then transition from defence to attack based off that football. The yellow player here, who was in possession of the football, will just drop it and try and get back into his defensive shape. This game is very, very intense, and there is, is very little breaks for the players as you progress through the different types of restarts, from kickouts to the middle of the field, and then from the coach restarts. It should be played until the intensity and the quality of the play drops. New conditions and constraints, which we will look at next, should only be added when the following is, this, is the case. The players become comfortable with the game, and also the coach may decide to introduce a new condition or constraint to promote something that he cannot observe within the gameplay. Some of the game adaptations are as follows. A shot clock can be introduced whereby the team in possession has a certain amount of time to score. For example, 10 seconds. So if the grey team were to turn over the ball in this position, they would have 10 seconds to get a shot off on the goals down the bottom. If the speed that your team is transitioning with from defence to attack is too slow, you can limit no the number of touches or plays that the players can take. As we've seen already, the ball position or ball start restarts can be changed. You may have identified as a result of your analysis that a number of your turnovers are occurring in this area of the field here and you want to improve upon this. You will then try as a coach to restart the ball as you are restarting the game from these areas here. You may also realise that your restart as you turn over the ball in the middle of the field you are not very effective at transitioning from a defensive setup to your attack and play, so more restarts may have to happen, or the ball position will have to start within these areas. You can also use the channels here. Some adaptions for the channels include the following. You must, as the coach, see a support run within each of these channels as the team is transitioning up the field. If you don't, the ball turns over to the other team. You may also limit the number of passes per channel. If you limit the number of passes per channel to, say, two in this example, it will force the players to change the point of the attack, thus moving the defence of the team that's on defence to change their shape and move around. It will also encourage more width within your team as they transition from defence to attack and within their attack and play. Another way in which you can adapt this game is to introduce a joker. A joker is one player, for example this player here, who will put on a different colour boot to the two teams. He will play at all times with the attacking team and he is seen as the link player between defence and attack. He is restricted to being within this middle zone. So as the grey team is transitioning from defence out, they will look to use that player as he is the spare player within this team, and he will then link the play between the defence and attack in units. Another way in which you can adapt is the scoring of the game. For example, if you want to encourage turnovers with a quick transition and a score within your team, you can give double scores for your team, for a team getting a turnover, a quick transition, and then a score. If they were to score a goal, this would then be worth six points. And if they were to score a, po a point, it would be worth two points. Another way in which to adapt the scoring of the game is including the shot clock adaptation, which we have talked about previously. In this game, you are giving your team 10 seconds to transition from defense to attack. If they do a very quick transition 
and get a shot off at second number six and you're calling it out, you would then assign them six points for that score. This does not restrict the number of plays that they have, but will encourage them to transition the ball as fast as they see fit using the principles that you use for your team. Finally, another way to adapt this game is that you would instruct one of the teams to carry out a specific role. Within this example, we will use the yellow team for this. You as the coach will instruct the yellow team to really focus on defending in this middle channel as this is seen as the scoring zone. This provides a problem for the grey team as they are transitioning, but also as they are attacking. They have to figure out what way the yellow team are defending, but also what way they need to transition from defence to attack. It is only a restriction that you are putting or an instruction that you are giving to the yellow team when they are in defence that they're concentrating on defending this zone back here. You can make up your own instructions which suit your team. There are a number of complementary activities that assist with the playing of this game. Any games that encourage the player to support the player on the ball will definitely complement this game. All transition games which work on the transition from defence to attack and also any games which encouraging the switching of the play. This game, I feel, adheres to the Thurs principles. First of all, it will test and challenge the players, their awareness both on and off the ball, what they do with the ball and where they are making their runs. The basic skills being performed are efficient and at pace. The information processing skills that take place during the course of this game as there is no repetition the same at any time. And finally, their communication skills as they transition from defence to attack, how they're informing the player on the ball of the picture. This game gives the coach the opportunity to observe and analyse the player and their understanding of their own role within the attra attacking transition and also within attacking play. It is highly representative of the game that the players are playing and provides them with the pictures that they will hopefully see when they play in competitive games. All players are involved and there are lots and lots of decisions both on and off the ball. All players at all levels just want to play the game. With the different rules, conditions, constraints and scoring that you could play with this, for a full, you could play this for a full session and have a massive amount of coaching opportunities. This game could also be played for your defensive transition, which goes from attack to defence, and how you defend. So we saw two um, videos there from James and Michael um, break out in time to run and the three channel resist, uh, transition. Sorry. And the beauty of both of these games is, is probably a question we get asked a lot. How do we challenge the stronger player or adapt for the weaker player? But because there's both sides of the pitch, you can actually pair them off at the start that you might have your stronger down one side and your weaker down the other. That way that you're challenging your stronger players and your weaker players at the same time, following along with our tourist principles. Also, yeah. sorry, Paddy, go on. Well, I'll fire ahead, go. Um, also, there, both mentioned a joker or a sweeper and with the new black card sim, uh, Simbin rule and all that you're definitely going to come up against teams when they're playing games that there might be an extra person or how often do we play backs and forwards when we know ourselves that we never see backs and forwards six players and a half taking on each other it never happens in a game there's always runners there's always a sweeper so it's great that it's resembling the game that way as well what one thing i might add to, to both of the games is um something i've used myself especially when um, communication might not be great among players. I, I'd add in the silent game for five minutes into one of those, as there were the coaches and players, none of them are allowed to talk. They're not allowed to communicate with each other. 
and just see how powerful the message is in when there's no silence. They're still playing the games, but there's no communication. There's no shouts and calls for the ball. And then when you turn it back on, turn on the communication again, you can see how powerful the message is and the players are buying into it a lot more. Um, there, there's a question there from Barry, Paddy. Do you want to take that? Yeah, so it was, it was just on the full back line. The big thing I would say there is that you'd hope obviously be not in a game situation. You have to make that call and give them advice. But the idea I would say to me is, first of all, is as a defender, they want it, I suppose, they don't want the ball going to their, the guy they're marking. They don't want to, so they want to deny the pass. So it's very important to, to stay goal side, but step up on your man, take your arm and put it across the guy in your leg and step up. So when the, the team in James' game were on the midfield and they were looking up, they see a defender blocking off that pass. That would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is that, obviously, if, if, if the player isn't a lot of confidence and you do have extra defenders there, that's fine. But they have to make a decision then, do they go, do they step in front of them? So... Ideally, what you need to be doing in training, as Kieran was saying, was giving them different situations all the time. When they're left isolated one on one or two v two, when they're left when there's a, a joker or, or a, a an extra defender sitting there, or two extra defenders, and the more opportunities the players get in them positions, the better decisions they will make. And that comes into Michael's point on what you thought was a brilliant one: was move on when the players are comfortable with what you're doing. Because we're trying to make the players uncomfortable on the pitch. Get them in situations that they have to think and they have to stretch and they have to they have to challenge themselves. And you're trying to challenge them all the time. That's a really important point that if it isn't working, change the game. If it's if it's working and it's too easy, well, let's make them uncomfortable. And that brings us on to the great point here. Damien is up on the slide is the, um, the step principle. Every one of the games that you've been shown tonight, plus the games that will be in the resource as well, Damien will go through in a few minutes, they've all been altered by step. So how can you change any game? You can change the spaces played on, you can make it bigger or smaller. You can change the time or the task, what they're doing from a kick pass to a hand pass or cross wheel ball. You can change the rules. How do you change the equipment? Well, you can add two footballs into the game. How do you change the personnel? You add in an extra defender, an extra attacker, a person that can play with both teams. And that will totally change the emphasis of the game. But it, what it will do is it'll challenge the players that you're not just playing the same game all the time. And what I'd say to the coaches is tonight is that we've done four games. There's another five games in the resource and there's hundreds of games out there, but you have games yourself. And I challenge every coach tonight on the um, on the course and whoever else logs onto it is that pick three games yourself of your own games at home. And what you've got to do then is, is just use the step principle and make three more games of all of those. So that'll be nine extra games that you have going back into your season. And use the games you're familiar with and make up games yourselves. But the games you use yourself and ones you got tonight, there's definitely ways you can vary them games using step models. That's really, really important. Um, just another opportunity there. If anyone has any more questions, type them in. Um, someone had mentioned uh, the app we used on Frank's video earlier on. He, it's, it's a soccer app called Tactics Manager. And... Um, Tactical pad was also one mentioned in the comments there if anyone's interested in in those. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody. Uh, firstly, uh, just some of your club mates that maybe weren't able to get in. Um, we're very aware that we've been getting text messages and the phone have been going crazy. So uh, some of you might or might not be aware there was an incident in a club outside of Longford at the weekend where one of their live streams got hacked and uh, potentially <clears throat> some of the accessibility might have been limited to what we're providing tonight. So it seems like anybody that was trying to get in that didn't have a, a Hotmail or an Outlook account um, or one of those based, maybe their work account is based on Outlook or Office, uh, that they weren't able to get in. So we'll try and find some answers to that as the week goes along and we'll be all set for next week. Kieran will talk a little bit about that as we move on. So I just wanted to show you the resource and where you can get all of tonight's information. So if you go to our website, longfordga.ie, coaching and coaching webinars. <clears throat> so that'll open up here. Obviously, this is where you got your link to come in. Uh, the links for the following weeks will be down here, plus their resources. So this one here, link to youth adult games resource for download. So... Just give that a wee click and you'll open up the a folder, a lot of information in here. So as Paddy says, you've seen four videos. Uh, you've seen Frank, James, John and Michael. 
So Kieran has one in there, I have one in there, Paddy has one in, and or Kieran has one in and Paddy has one in as well. So you get eight videos in total, plus uh, say if we pick Michael's there, you get a, a diagram and you also get an explainer, a, a text document that explains everything that had gone on in the video. So you can watch the video again, but you don't necessarily have to. So you can view them there or you can download them. Then also one of the big feedback that we had got um, over the last couple of weeks was all the videos that was doing the rounds. Uh, Michael Quinn, Daniel Mimna, um, the Leinster GA uh, skills practice circuit that myself and Paddy done, Donald McGillius. So all of those videos are in there. If you want to download them, drip feed them out to your clubs, your players, challenge them, get them to post some messages um, so everything is there. Some people found that when they were on Twitter, it was very hard getting them off it. Uh, you can download them all from that resource. And then finally, at the very bottom here, is um, the selection of games. So based on the same principle as the PowerPoint, but uh, this way. so going through the same principle, but now you have additional games here rather than the ones that were done in the video. So everything in the video is not in this resource. They're two separate things. So uh, we would like to get some of your feedback about um, the question this question resource and whether you see value in attending another webinar whereby we will go through the rest of these games and not in the formal sense of having pre-recorded videos, but to go through these and hopefully engage a little bit more um, interaction over and back. Uh, so I'll hand you back to Kieran and Paddy and they can tidy up the last few questions there. And if anybody else has any more questions, you can pop them into it. Thanks very much. Uh, Paddy, you there? Yeah, there, Kieran. Yeah, can you hear me? Just a question there. In the tourist model, what is the aspect relating to individualized development? How is that done in a games-based model? I suppose there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, if you have a really good player, you want to test and challenge and make it individual to them. So you could easily put, obviously, them working on their weaker foot, or you could put two guys marking them. So they could be in a, an overload position that there's two guys on them. There's two ways of challenging a stronger guy. Another way could be is that maybe you might have two weaker players in a game-based model that you might play two inside forwards against one defender. So there's loads of different ways you can condition. But what you can do is condition players individually. There's no there's no harm in doing that. It, the condition in the game doesn't have to affect the whole the whole team. It can it, it can affect people individually as well. And you might give them a target to do so. Again, strong players and weak players can be can be um, can be challenged that way. And that's where the individualization comes into it in the terrorist model. That we're trying to make it central, I suppose, central to, to the individual all the time. And again, that's looking at conditioning players in different ways and give, and challenging them. That's the big thing: challenge them and make it individual to them all the time. It's not just you're not just you're not just doing it as a team, but you're also doing it as an individual as well. So I hope that answers the question. If you've anything else, Kieran, on it. No, no, that's that's brilliant. That definitely answers the question. And for everyone still there, just. Grab your attention onto the, the screen there. It's just the breakdown of the webinars over the next um, three weeks after tonight. The child on the 13th next Monday, it's child coaches 8th under 12. Um, the 20th, we're looking at strength and conditioning resources from 13th to adult. And then nursery from 4 to 6th for the, the final one on the Monday, the 27th. So even if it's not related to you, you might pass on to the other coaches in, in your club and county. I don't think there's any more questions there, Paddy. It's all good. Uh, just check here in the, one second, Kieran. No, it doesn't seem to be. Just one thing I'd like to iterate is that all the resources on the website, there's a load there. And again, the challenge to the coaches that are on tonight, pick three games, use the step model and change your games and come away with a, a bulk of games that you like using, but you've changed to suit your team. That's really, really important. And I hope that that's the main message we're trying to get across tonight, that if you can change your games to to look at them terrorist principles and will they affect your coaching and make it better, make it more individualised and make it more challenging for your players. And again, use the games you have yourself, but also use the games we looked at tonight and try and challenge yourself as a coach. Rather than just challenging your players, challenge yourself as a coach. Pick three games, use the step model and see can you develop some other games out of the way the lads done it tonight. 
And finally, everyone, just for me, uh, I'd like to thank both Paddy and Kieran and Owen and Brandon and all the lads that contributed videos there behind the scenes. Um, uh, hopefully you get the message that we're very much open for business. Um, we want to support you as best we can. Uh, when we've been touching in with clubs the last couple of weeks, we've really found that, you know, people have just completely stepped away from things at the minute because of the whole situation that's going on. But I definitely know if your house is anything like my house, we want to try and get back to some form of normality and, and using some moments to really treat it as learning. Uh, this is a time of year when we would be flat to the mass and we wouldn't take that opportunity to, to start learning. So hopefully you can encourage the rest of your club coaches to get involved in those ones. So like obviously next week is a child one and then we're back to a youth adult uh, in two weeks time and then nursery. And we also have some more ideas there for me if, if this situation continues on. So again, very much open for business. We're on the phones. Give us a call. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for tuning in to us. All the best. Slong of all.